Hello, everyone, and welcome to St. Matthew's Anglican Church. I'm the priest here, Reverend Philip Stonhouse, and every Wednesday, we have a bit of fun just exploring different churches from throughout the world. Today, we are in uh, St. Aloysius Church in Glasgow, uh, Glasgow, Scotland. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, I've never actually heard of that saint, but something I have to look up later. This church is, is really special. It kind of reminds me of um, Versailles in, in France, that hall of mirrors and that beautiful, um, not castle, but a mansion. Um, there's a way of the, the, this space just sort of invites you into like a kingship, a royalty, an honor, a glory um, that is really beautiful and special. You know, even the, the images uh, portrayed telling the different stories have this finer quality to them um, that feel like they're painted with gold and with um, the finest of colors. And so it speaks to us of being in an art gallery or living in an art gallery, being invited in the marble pillars, everything uh, just has this finer detail. Um, that kind of now reminds me of the finer detail of creation. Each of these things that we look out on has an order and a beauty. Um, and such fine detail that makes it special and ornate. And especially when it's all in its own place, where it should be. <laughs> I've been gardening a lot, so weeds are just on my mind. Where things are where they should be. It just has this pristine glory and beauty that invites you in, invites you to look in, to smell, to touch, to listen. And I kind of feel like this place has that. There's that obvious feeling of, of bringing you forward, but then there's space all throughout for you to dwell, but then for each of these things to dwell, you know, whether it's the glorious sort of star and images at, um, at the dome, the, the table, which then reminds you of the table below or the star above. Uh, that's probably, oh, I don't think that is an angel. Um, but everything has its place and invites you in. Every little alcove with its image, probably a saint. Um, but it's really special when everything has its right place and um, invites us in, offers us our place. So this is St. Aloysius Church in Glasgow. And now we're going to look at the Book of Common Prayer. This is the traditional form of worship in the Anglican Church. Um, hopefully soon we'll be able to go back to in-person um, services that on Wednesdays, where we'll also be able to live stream it at the same time. So just look forward to that. Um, but in the meantime, let's just do it now. I'm going to start off by singing Ferris Lord Jesus, which is him. 619 if you have a blue book at home. Let's now just, before we start to sing, take a moment to center ourselves in God, trusting that he is with us, even if we can't feel him, but nonetheless reaching out and trying to recognize his presence as he is with us. He wants to guide us this day. He wants to fill our hearts with his love. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, oh, thou the God it's human son. Thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, 
thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fair still the woodlands, robed in glooming garb of spring. Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the troubled heart to sing. There is the sunshine, fair still the moonlight, and fair the twinkling starry hopes. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer, all the angels heaven and ghosts. Let's end it there. I kept going higher in key every time. <laughs> We'll start on page four or page 60 in page 60 in the PDF or four in the book. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you as many as are here present to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice under the throne of the heavenly grace. So let's pray together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We've offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which you ought to have done, and we have done those things which you ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesu, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, we beseech him to grant us true repentance, that his Holy Spirit, that, and his Holy Spirit, that those things that plead may please him, which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Top of the next page. O Lord, open thou our lips and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Our readings for today are the readings for the fourth Sunday after Trinity, found on page 239 or 305 in the PDF. Our first reading is taken from Galatians 5, verse 25. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, 
If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be also tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Here ends the first reading. Our gospel reading is taken from St. Luke, the 17th chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. And it came to pass, as Jesus went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go, show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when, they, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his feet, fell down on his face at his feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's now just take a moment to our center ourselves on God. And hear what he's trying to say to us in these passages. You know, every time I come up against one of these, the, a pair of passages or a Sunday readings, I'm always debating how are these connected? You know, because there's only one set of readings for the BCP throughout the whole year um, for Sundays. And so every passage is connected. They chose them very specifically to be together. And so, but it came to me today, just as we we're praying just now that, that idea of living by the spirit and that not pursuing vain glory or envy is actually paired well with what the nine versus the one did with Jesus. So when we seek after things of the spirit, they don't have the same fleshly aspect. They don't, there's a mystery to it, a uh, invisible quality. This this is sometimes one of the hardest things to grasp because it's, you know, it's not tactile in the same way. And so often today's world, we're mostly grasping at tactile things, things that bring strong emotions, things that we see or feel or touch or taste. You know, even film has such a tactile experience to it, even if it does to work at an emotional level. Uh, the music, the words, the images, Excuse me. But the things of the spirit are so much more than that. They have the tactile, but the tactile only just begins to speak to it. I think about those nine when they were cleansed. So they went to Jesus, they called him master, which is an amazing start, and we all need to do that. And they trusted in him to help them. Again, everything we all need to do. 
as they were going to the priest, they found themselves cleansed. So all of their, whatever form of, of Old Testament leprosy they had was cleansed. So maybe it was boils, maybe it was blisters, maybe it was um, rashes, maybe it was um, pus or whatever. Too much TMI, right? <laughs> um, it could have been any of those things. And they were cleansed. Now, they didn't do anything wrong by continuing to go to the priest or the temple or the synagogue. You know, the, in the Old Testament order, that's the way it should go. And even Jesus kind of said that to them. But the one man went the step further. Because when you go to the priest, when you go to the temple, when you go to the synagogue, these are authoritative, beautiful, like this, like this space, um, spaces. And they have authority and all of that. And so there's a certain appeal to that, a certain drive to go to the official quality of it. But something about Jesus and something working in this man, one man, the one Samaritan, saw that Jesus was the actual one that he should show himself to and give praise of. You know, it probably should have been evident to the nine that it was Jesus that should be praised in this moment with God, um, even if they didn't understand it was God at the time. because he was the one that did it. But something drove them further. We talked about, was it this uh, last Sunday, not this, uh, not this prior Sunday, but the Sunday before, about um, how so many people wanted community or healing more than they wanted Jesus. But this person came right back to Jesus. He saw in Jesus that there was something so much more special. And an interesting thing, and in the passage doesn't say this, but I think we can um, read into it, this, is when Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priest, this one Samaritan comes back to Jesus because in this moment, he's recognizing that Jesus is playing the role of the priest. Not only is he master and king and servant, but now he's also playing the role of the priest. And so by coming and showing himself to Jesus, He's not only doing that work of reunification and being united again with God, but he's also being united in community, but um, kingdom community. And the amazing thing about this man uh, coming back to Jesus and having a faith that is more than just the tactile, that spiritual quality that um, Paul talks about in, to the Galatians, is that 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 faith that was given by God, by Jesus. Now Jesus tells him, arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. So there's sort of three huge things that happen here. He arise, he gets him to stand up. He, there's this idea in that arise that Jesus has now given you strength of your own to get up and move. Go thy way. Because this man's spiritual faith has guided him to Jesus, his whole way, his whole direction has been marked out by that spiritual quality rather than just the tactile, the fleshly quality. And thy faith has made thee whole. Now it's not just about healing or cleansing, but it's the whole part of him that is whole. It's everything that in Christ can be healed because this man was willing to give up on the tactile so that he might see Jesus. There's a few things in the, the first uh, reading that I'd just like to uh, bring to your attention just because they're special parts of this, what it means to live in the spirit and not the flesh. 
So that vain glory, not seeking after things, glorious things that are vain, that are uh, fickle, that are going to disappear, you know, whether it's money or a big house or nice things or praise from your friends. All of that is glory that is vain and lacking. And you might even see say that this place that we're standing in right now has a bit of that vain glory. But nonetheless, is all glory is meant to speak to a non-vain kind of glory. A beautiful and eternal kind of glory that comes in God alone. And so this points the way. But all churches will fall and will be left with uh, God alone. And that beautiful passage in Revelations where you have no more need for the sun because God is their light among them. So all other glory will fall to nothing. Um, so do not desire vain glory, provoking one another. We can provoke one another in our own vain glory, in our own seeking other things, or in our own envying. When we envy one another, Again, that is not seeking after the spiritual reality of things. But instead, it's usually seeking after things. The vain, unspiritual quality of things. Um, if we're to envy one another in faith, in the spiritual quality of things, well, that is quickly replaced with the very reality that God's faith is in us and we have nothing to be jealous of in the same way because we not only have our own gifts and uh, our own capacities and our own journey of faith but in Christ we are all one and the amazing faith that he has planted in anyone else he wants is in us if we just live into it um, be, when, when someone is overtaken by a fault, do this in meekness. That's a really important idea. Um, not assuming that we know everything and that um, we're going to be able to just correct them absolutely, but with a kind of meekness where we recognize our own fault in the midst of it. And this is really important because you know, I know in my own life when I have tried to correct people in the fault, in the in one of their faults. So often I'm doing something wrong myself to some degree or not recognizing my fault. And in, in another, that kind of uh, instills a kind of pride. And you spend so much time looking at the other person's fault, but not at your own. And so in that way, you're tempted and uh, you help lose your, it helps you lose your way. But instead, bear one another's burdens. It's a beautiful idea um, of helping everyone carry their load. There's so many things we go into that goes on in our lives that we can't carry on our own. And a lot of the time, those aren't just physical things. They might be pressures and that sort of thing. They might be emotional. Um, but so often what we really need is just one another to help us in that or help some people help us carry something really invisible and so talking and praying together is a big part of that but then helping one another when we can if there is something tactile or spiritual we can do the last part of that reading um you know each of these is a sermon unto itself so i'm really just glossing over but the last part of that reading is uh, really just not to think too highly of yourself. It's good to believe in yourself and, and to move forward as if you can do it, um, but to really test yourself. You know, there's a lot of ways in which we might brag or tell stories that show us in the best light or post the best photos on Facebook or Instagram or whatever um, that de are deceptive both to ourselves and others. Um, and it's, uh, probably just as bad to be deceptive of our, to ourselves because that means we're always not just expecting something better of ourselves, but we're never actually living up 
to um, our lies. And that can give us a very, very poor self, uh, self perspective and so many other things and poor relationship with everyone else and God and we'll blame other people and X, Y, and Z. But really let prove your own work, prove who you are by what you do so that then you may depend on yourself, so to speak. It's funny this, because they both, this passage in this particular translation both talks about taking up one another's burdens, but you must carry it on your own. My guess, I don't know Greek, but my guess is that it um, might be one word that means two different things, because that often happens in Greek, especially in Hebrew it happens, but oftentimes in Greek too. Um, or it has a different connotation in this one. But, um, you know, when, when you're looking at how you depend on yourself or um, there's both this quality in our lives that we don't talk about in the Western world as much anymore, this way in which we depend both on community and ourselves. It's not individualistic, it's not just community, it's both. And so we know we both have to carry our burdens, but others also have to share it. Um, and that we can't do it on our own, but at the same time, that's what we're left with. Um, and so there's a part of which we must know ourselves to be able to even do the community part. Um, but then it might also be talking about um, you know, you are the only one that can live into your reality. You're the only one that can um, prove your own work and live into your work, even when it's in community. And so there's a way in which both are true. <laughs> Anyways, I've talked enough already. Let's now just take a moment to pray to God and ask him for guidance so that we might dwell more on the spiritual realities. Lord God, your faith in us is powerful and strong and life-giving. We thank you that your faith has done so much for us, that it can show us the true spiritual reality of the things in our lives, of the people and places. Lord God, may our hopes, may our work, may our very lives live out that spiritual reality so that we do not provoke envy or vainglory or anything of the sort that is not good or life-giving. When we find healing or rest or peace or anything good, may we return to you, Lord, May we see you and know you. May we praise you with our whole hearts. Lord God, help us to carry our own burdens, but also help us to help others carry theirs. And so help us to live into that faith that you have planted in us, that you have lived out, that your spirit desires to work in us. Amen. And now let us say together the creed found on page 10 or 66 in the middle of the page. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer on the top of the next page. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue to pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give unto us the increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain that which thou dost promise. Make us to love that which thou dost command through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's say together the call for peace on page 11 or 67. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in, our, in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's now just take a moment to pray for all those that we know need our prayers. Lord God, we pray for all those that are struggling with mental health at this time, who still experience anxiety or depression or great lows. who uh, are losing memories, who are angry, feeling lost without purpose. We pray for all those who have uh, social struggles those that are um, trapped at home, we pray for those uh, who don't have people that they really can connect with, um, those who have to take care of many children or um, family members or friends. We pray for those that are bullied or teased, don't have good friends, those that are feeling isolation. I pray for all the kids as they return to school. As they prepare to return to school. I pray for parents and teachers. We pray for St. Matthew's relationship with schools. Pray, Lord, that you might um, inspire principals to uh, be willing to connect with me and figure out how we might work together. I pray, Lord, for teachers who might all grow together in that faith and love. Pray for the three schools in our loop that are quite close to us. Or four, if you can include Our Lady of Peace. We pray, Lord, for all those um, that have physical struggles, whether it's lack of mobility, sickness, pains from aging. Mm -hmm cancer, or whatever else, Lord. Please, Lord, be with them. May your Holy Spirit dwell with them, and may you guide their doctors and nurses. Where it is your will, Lord, we pray for healing and for growing strength. Work your miracles, Lord. Where it may not be your will or may not be right, Lord, we still pray for strength. We pray for vision and 
your presence, your comforting presence, that peace that is greater than we can imagine. May we all know that peace, Lord. Lastly, Lord, we turn to you in thanks and praise for all the wonderful things you have given us, and the life you have given us. We thank you for uh, parents that turn from baptism and adults that want to be baptized. We thank you, Lord, for beautiful days, the summer, for friends and family, for children. We thank you for uh, music, for the community of St. Matthews. We thank you for uh, that usually we have enough, enough to eat and keep us warm. Pray, Lord, that we may always be thankful that we may pray, praise you continuously for the work of love you have done through your one and only Son. We praise you that you have died for us and that you have healed and done miracles in today's world, in our lives. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with all of you and worship with all of you. Um, I look forward to when I get to see you in person. But until then, God bless you and uh, have a lovely day. Bye, everyone.